Hi, my name is Kimi Ide Foster. I am the immediate past president and a current director with Hawaii Women Lawyers. And I do want to say before we get started, um, first of all, thank you to Think Tech for having us. We're really excited about this. Um, and a little bit of background about Hawaii Women Lawyers. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1982. Our mission is to improve the lives and careers of women in the legal profession, to influence the future of the legal profession, and to enhance the status of women and promote equal opportunities for all. Uh, we recognize that's quite a lofty goal, and we really couldn't accomplish any of that without the amazing individuals in our community, uh, which brings us to today's segment, actually. Each year, Hawaii Women Lawyers honors select individuals for their uh, contributions to our profession, uh, public service, and our support of our mission. And today, I have the great honor to proudly, and I'm so sorry, belatedly, <laughs> award our 2020 Presidential Award to Ms. Rachel Wong. And I'm also here with uh, my co-host, Kathy Bett. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us today. Um, and if my, why don't you guys start off by introducing yourself? Kathy, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, if everybody. You're... Kathy Betts. Um, I'm the current director of the Department of Human Services, and I'm very grateful to be here today with all of these amazing women. Thank you. And I'm Rachel Wong. Um, I'm a former director of the Department of Human Services, had the honor of that, and now lead One Year Future Social Impact Business and also co-lead the Safe Spaces and Workplaces Initiative to end workplace sexual harassment. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, congratulations, Rachel, on receiving the Hawaii Women <laughs> Lawyers President's Award. Sorry, Kimmy, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say the exact same thing. Like, I'm so sorry that we're a year late and we completely missed your celebratory dinner. But <laughs> we really appreciate having you here today. Um, and Kathy, did you want to get started with your line of questions first or just kind of jump into this? We can just jump in. Okay. Um, so, you know, the first thing I want to talk about is, Rachel, for better or for worse, I think almost everybody associates you as being kind of the first and most prominent whistleblower under the Me Too movement. Um, and that's not, that's not a fair assessment of all the things you've done in the community and all of the leadership roles you've done um, with you know, the Director of Human Services. I know you've also been at the Healthcare Association of Hawaii and your, your list of accomplishments goes, goes on and on. But like I said, for better or for worse, I think most of us are just incredibly grateful to you for what you did in advancing the Me Too cause. And I know that we've spoken about this in private. And, you know, of course, if there's anything that comes up that you do not want to talk about, just tell us and we'll move we'll on. Um, but I think like Kathy was saying earlier when we were chatting prior to this meeting is, you know, what kind of was going through your mind and how did you, like, how did you find the courage to do this? Like where, you know, kind of tell us about that whole experience, I think. Sure, you know, and I want to start off by thanking Hawaii Women Lawyers um, for recognizing people in the community. You, you folks have been vanguards in so much of what you do, opening up space for women, for equity. Um, Kathy, and the work that you've done throughout your career, same thing. And so I, I, I see this conversation as more of that opening up the space to talk about difficult conversations. And so much what I've learned in Hawaii is that, you know, we, we really do have our culture of silence. And so when you ask me about, you know, my own experience, I don't think it's unique. It's just something that I was in a place where I could come forward. And for those who are not familiar, you know, when I was serving as a department director, had experienced workplace sexual harassment by a then powerful legislator. And at that time, in that moment, even with a male colleague with me, I just, I felt powerless. There was, there was nothing that I could say or do to prevent that from happening. Because of, Kathy, you know, the responsibility you carry when you're representing and serving over 300,000 people in the community. And so had talked to other people, you know, had and learned that there was really not much because it was different branches of government. And so just kind of compartmentalized it. Like, like women, men, kids, you know, non-binary, we've all been bullied at some point in our lives. And, um, you know, we move forward. So it wasn't until the Me Too movement came aboard and started going across the country and the world that one day I woke up and I realized I was just this, I was internally compelled to say something. 
and I was in a place where I was working independently and I was no longer constrained by uh, fear of losing our budget or retaliation. And my main concerns were making sure my husband was okay because it's your loved one that goes through with you if you, you know, I filed a very, what ended up being a public sexual harassment complaint. And um, also out of um, consideration to the governor to give him a heads up and he gave his immediate support. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Rachel, I remember us having some conversations prior to that, and I, I'm just still in awe of your courage and bravery because I, I don't think if I was in the same shoes, if I, I'm not sure if I would be able to come forth. So I know that there's a lot of people in the community that are very grateful for what you've done just by making that step. And like you said, sharing that space, creating a safe space to have the language around what is happening because I think everyone is a lot of times in isolation and they feel like perhaps um, whether there's gaslighting or a toxic work environment, I think a lot of people feel like they're alone and they can't necessarily come forth. So um, just want to thank you on behalf of so many other women. Thank you. And, and you know, I should share, and I, I don't know if I shared this with both of you and, and now a larger audience is that when I say compelled, it was really because it came from a deep place within that was rooted, when I really went down, it was rooted in a place of love for Hawaii. You know, love for Hawaii and hope for a different future so that others wouldn't have to be treated this way. And so, you know, with me too coming forth, it, it's a different time now. I recognize that in the past, there were different types of acceptable, acceptable behavior. And that's not the case now where, you know, we can really build on our shared values in Hawaii of mutual respect of inclusion, of diversity, of aloha. And so when I realized that this is where it was coming from, I, I really don't see it as courageous. I, I was propelled forth and very cognizant that every step of the way was hoping, I was hoping to open the doors and broaden the doorway for others. And um, so it was never, it was never about, you know, uh, him versus me or it versus us. It was really about how might we all. And so I think, you know, when I when people still find me and we talk about changing systems and people continue to come forward every day and speak their truths and are hoping for change, you know, changing systems. Mine was just very public. You know, it's I want to acknowledge that this is happening all the time and that it really helps to come from a place that is rooted in something that is limitless. You know, anger can motivate you, but it will burn you out at some point. And I think we see yeah. you, you know, from two individuals that know you well, you know, we see you living your core values. So and I, I can understand that, um, I guess, explanation of being compelled from somewhere within to do something rather than thinking with the logical brain, right, of, of being fearful or I need to, you know, really grit up to have some courage to do this. Like, I, I can see that you you know, obviously live your core values, but from that experience, it helped you create safe spaces and workplaces. And then it also informs some of your work with One Shared Future. I wanted to see if you can talk a little bit about safe spaces and workplaces and um, maybe also some of the good work that you're doing with One Shared Future right now. Sure, thank you. Um, and, you know, I, I, I want to share that we're all doing the same work, so many of us. It's, it's our different training. It's our approaches. And so just here today that, you know, we're, we're expanding the space for this conversation. So thanks for um, Safe Spaces and Workplaces. It's an initiative between One Shared Future and Child and Family Service. And we founded it in 2019. And it was born out of many of our experiences with workplace sexual harassment Karen Tan, who's the CEO of CFS, Child and Family Service, she gathered a group of women together, you know, and I remember we were in the basement of a, of a local establishment and went around the room, all execs, all people you would recognize. And in our introductions, every single woman shared about her own one workplace sexual harassment experience. You know, I remember one was her first job as a teenager and someone else shared about something that happened the previous week. And it was this recognition that we all have the shared experience and what might we do about it. We were fortunate that Hawaii Women Lawyers had already launched its survey, I, I think at that time, and folks were just about mm -hmm. to publish it about 
female attorneys' um, experiences in Hawaii, which were graphic and sobering and sombering. And um, our circles expanded and the conversations became, we need to do something, but what? And so Karen and I, you know, with a small hui of people that represent employment experts, um, sexual harassment, um, subject matter experts, communications, people who all volunteered their time said, let's come together and act. And so the idea behind safe spaces and workplaces is we conducted the first statewide survey of workplace sexual harassment and found that nearly the majority of people, the respondents in our survey, men, women, you know, have, have been sexually harassed during their time working in Hawaii. 42% of men, 52% of women. You know, um, once we started naming what workplace harassment is, that it's not just somebody ogling you or touching you. It can be inappropriate text messages. It can be someone on Zoom, you know, sending messages or instructing you to dress a certain way or wear more makeup. You know, we, we found that it's not a matter of if it happens, it's when. And so using that and building on our shared values, we reached out to employer champions throughout the state and said, will you be a part of standing with us for building and nurturing safe and respectful workplaces? And several of these initial founding champions, you know, they gave their time, they gave their support, and they were part of us launching in November of 2019. And the idea is this collective for us to come together and be able to say, when something happens, what kind of education and support can we provide you so that you can do the right thing? So it's an ongoing yeah, process. And I, and I know that you've mentioned, Rachel, that you had, I, I think you said kind of your graduating classes of, of um, safe spaces and workplaces and one shared future. So what does kind of the program look like? Because I love the idea of having a collaborative approach because I think this is one of those problems that absolutely cannot be solved top down. In fact, that usually only exasperates the problem. Um, if you remember when we, like you said, Hawaii Women Lawyers did launch its survey and one of my absolute favorite responses that we got to this was like, well, no, because the appropriate thing to do for someone who's harassed is to report to their superior. And I was like, but something like 90% of the time it's the superior that's doing the harassing. So there's obviously a break in the chain here that needs to be fixed. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more about kind of like the collaborative approach you're talking about and how do you actually affect real change? Because I think it's very easy for corporations to sort of whitewash and say, yes, we're going to commit to doing X. It, it, you know, kind of like for pride, you turn your logo into a rainbow for one month and then you don't actually do anything. That, that doesn't achieve anything for anybody. So, you know, how do you how do you actually see concrete results? Thank you. Thanks for asking that. And I should make the distinction that One Shared Future is the primary work that I'm doing. Um, and that, that's the professional development, the consulting, the trainings um, and facilitation that we do. And that we partnered with CFS to do safe spaces and workplaces. And, but it, and it's the same thing. It's about how do we create safe spaces for people to gather around shared goals. So whether it's about um, improving the lives and opportunities for children in the foster care system or nurturing safe workplaces. It's gathering people together, building on strengths, you know, from an abundance growth mindset, providing the tools and shared experiences where you can be vulnerable and learn together and then actually implement the what ifs and what's possible. So for one shared future, you know, we've worked with many different state departments, some of the Honolulu city and county with the governor's cabinet, a lot of nonprofits. And so we're seeing that when we do bring people together and we affirm our strengths and our talents and our shared experience, that we can start to acknowledge the traumas in our own lives together, shared histories that could you know, have resulted in scar tissue building up. And when we acknowledge it, just like if we've been sexually harassed, it's how often do we get to pause and say, this happened to me? And I hear you, I believe you, this happened to you and I support you. And when that happens, there's the ability to say, okay, now how can we support each other for a different workplace or a different outcome? And the wisdom really comes from the people within. And with safe spaces and workplaces, we're flipping it on its head. We're not going after anyone. We're engaging employers to be champions in this. And one thing I should share is that when we started reaching out to CEOs and executive directors and community leaders, 
I would say, will you stand with us to be part of building safe workplaces? And many people immediately said, of course I will. This is part of our values because, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, you know, I believe in this. Others, you could see them thinking and they would say, yeah, th this would be good for our brand. This would be good for retention. Bottom line, yeah, we're in. And then mm -hmm. others asked me, who else has said yes? And when I listed the names of CEOs and leaders, they said, oh, we're in. And oh. so that's where I realized we can do positive nudging of people into saying, this is the standard of how we want to respect each other and live together in Hawaii. Absolutely. And I, Rachel, I like the way that you frame it as strengths-based and from an abundance mindset to do that work. Um, I know that a lot of your work focuses around navigating change. Um, and obviously this last year and a half has been us navigating rapidly every single day, processing a new change or a new emergency or a new rule or a new mandate. And it's, you know, it's hard for humans to continue at that speed processing or not processing. Um, can you share a little bit more about, about how you do that work and what kind of new projects that you're undertaking with navigating change? Sure. Thank you. You know, when we met earlier today, we talked about um, a phrase that Michelle Kirk at Pro Service had shared with me and I quickly adopted. And so many times people talk about the new normal after COVID. And she shared, it's the next normal because life is about the next normal and the next normal. And that's what the two of you excel at. And, you know, it's a matter of um, what we found with One Shared Future is we're working with so many government agencies with not with people like Hawaiian women lawyers who give, give, give. You know, women in general are in places of, of nurturing generations up, down, your workplace, your community, your families. And so what happened during COVID is that people who are already given, giving were being asked to give more. And what we started recognizing with our graduates is we would create open space on Friday afternoons for everybody is that people were tapped out without even knowing it. People were burning out before the pandemic. And so what we recognized, you know, before it started being um, the key phrasing, you know, we'd see in headlines and everything is self-care and well-being. And we started doing the research, you know, and from Healthy Minds Institute, you know, we started teaching that well-being is a skill. And so we started offering a five session series over Zoom called Thriving and Change and Challenge. It's about cultivating resilience. And we've worked with departments around the state, with nonprofits, with men's group, with different groups. And it's really about when you're going so hard that you don't even know that you're about to pass out because you're so dehydrated. And what if you have support and time and space for someone to, or someone's to bring people together and to co-create the standards of presence in that safe space and put in an IV so that you can hydrate and come back up to the starting blocks. And then along the way, get to experience and learn some tools, knowledge, so that you can continue to drink along the way through work, through life. So that's what we've been doing. And we're finding that um, it's been, not only has it been very impactful for people in their workplace, They've taken it into their homes. They're sharing it with others. You know, it includes mindfulness and science and, you know, balance. And it's things that are accessible that we all need. And um, to recognize that this has been a long haul for many, many people. Yeah, I, I love that phrase, the next normal, because I think that, you know, we had spoken before this, that I now that people are starting to kind of go back to the office or go back to their workspaces and things are reopening, not just in Hawaii, but across the country, there's definitely a tension building. You can see it between, I think, kind of the, the big the big boss corporations. They want to snap things back to the way it was before, but you can't, you can't rewind the clock. You know, things have happened and we've all had to grow and change. And so, you know, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on how do we, how do we create a next normal that actually works for people? Because I think it's abundantly clear that the old normal, once we, you know, we're forced to hold it up to the light, it didn't work. It, it doesn't work. And, and like you were saying, people are burning out. Like Kathy, I can't even imagine your position during the pandemic. Like you weren't, you were just living all these changes in real time. And like, there's, there's no 
Trump, there's no, there's no net under you. <laughs> if you fall, you fall. And then everyone's like, well, then why didn't they do it this way? And it's like, okay, have you, have you tried Absolutely. navigating a state agency? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So yeah, Rachel, uh, if you could talk about that. Oh no, Kathy, go ahead. Just, just that I reminded myself and my staff very frequently that we needed to give each other grace because it was just, we could have ended up on the, you know, in the newspaper, what have you. Everybody makes mistakes, we're fallible. It shouldn't be expected that we're perfect all the time. No. Um, or even no. some of the time, <laughs> we're fallible <laughs> human, human beings. So just giving, um, you know, just giving and providing grace and space for people to have that, try to create some sort of balance during the last year and a half. Well, Kathy, I want to yeah. affirm that because we would be working with some of your team members you know, throughout the pandemic and your messaging trickled down. You know, to, to give to give each other and self grace. And so one of there were two things I wanted to share when you asked this question, Kimmy, is one, how do we support each other and how do we do it from our role? So Kathy, in your role as a director, you set the tone. You know, you created space for there to be flexibility. It wasn't binary of win, lose, you know, fail, succeed. It's we're here, you know, <laughs> we're human and, and we're doing what we can do. And so that's one, you know, that's one thing. And then a, 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 a optional, actionable way of doing that is, you know, one of my hopes that comes out of COVID is that we gain greater awareness of our own comfort levels. You know, we, we it's our risk assessment of, am I comfortable being in that space? Am I vaccinated? Do I wear a mask? Am I comfortable with the people who are there? Are we comfortable taking off masks? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how might we carry what we've learned with COVID and our own awareness into the next normal or next normal and so tangible way you know and local people you know we don't we don't you know stick out and we don't say things and that's part of the culture of silence but I've learned this you know to be able to offer up myself when I'm meeting with people I give options and I say well I'm fully vaccinated I'm comfortable always meeting on zoom or outside for a meal or this or this or this you know, I'm not asking anybody to disclose anything they're not comfortable with. You know, I'm just saying, this is what I'm comfortable with. Let me know what you do. And I want to, I want to match you. I want to meet you where you are. And in the same way, you know, as we've figured out new ways of interacting with people, I realized there's an opportunity when there's a group of people, especially those who don't know each other and those who know each other, to be the person that pauses and says, hey, we're about to take a picture. I just want to let folks know I'm okay taking our mask, my mask off for the for the group photo. Want to make sure that we only do that if everybody is, because we want to make sure that everybody's comfortable. And what if we built that in into our social and our work interactions with each other? I mean, what if it really was about knowing what we're comfortable with, asking what others are comfortable with, and respecting it? Might we not have as much sexual harassment? <laughs> Might we be able to interact in different ways in this next normal? So that's that's my hope. Yeah, it's funny when you say it like that. It's it's such an obvious parallel, you know, where it's like you wouldn't take off your mask if somebody specifically told you, "Hi, I'm uncomfortable with this." Um, but we had, you know, it, even that actually was something that at least I personally had to get comfortable saying to people, or when people would stand in my six foot bubble. Like one of the things that drives me absolutely nuts is when people stand between the dots on the floor and I'm like, those are there for a reason. What are you doing? <laughs> but like you said, it's the culture in Hawaii that you just stand there for and you're like, Ugh, I'm uncomfortable, but I'm not going to say anything, you know? So, so getting kind of creating that space and Kathy, you must, you must have to push that envelope too, where it's like, it, you, you've never struck me as an aggressive person, but you have to be an assertive person. <laughs> so, you know, I'd love to hear what you both have to say kind of about like, like Rachel says, how do you make this an actionable item? How do you actually get people to say, I need this space or respect, it? hey, they need that space? Right, well, I think logistically there are different, you know, processes you can put into place to make it feel less like you're being aggressive. And you're totally true, Kimmy. I'm, I'm not an aggressive person. And like, <laughs> like all of us, I don't, I don't like confrontation, um, but I try to, Think about how I would break something to like a friend. 
how do I say it really respectfully that I can get the message across that, you know, this isn't working or I'm not comfortable with this or, you, you know, you cross my boundary when this X, Y, Z happened. Um, I, I, it's, it is uh, just like wellness is a practice, Rachel. It, being able to articulate something clearly, um, directly, not aggressively or, or to inflict pain or mm-hmm. guilt or shame on someone, that is, it's a, it's a practice. It's a practice. And I mean, I had an experience just last week where I was like, I don't want to say what I have to say. And I, it almost <laughs> felt like I went out of body and it just came out and it ended up coming out respectfully because I, you know, I want to treat people with respect and dignity in the workplace. It hurts me when I hear people are, are in a toxic work environment or not comfortable or not feeling well or safe. So I think going from that direct point of, you know, with dignity and respect, um, but that's not always easy, especially if somebody else hasn't necessarily treated you with dignity or respect, how you make that message clear. It's, it's hard and it's a practice. Yeah, and I would add, because Kathy, you're, you're so wise, I would add it gets easier when there's people standing beside you. You know, in the Obama White House, they found that women were being talked over, and so they started amplifying each other. So, Kathy, you say something, and I reference this. So, as Kathy just said, and so why can't that be for any type of difficult, you know, conversation or creating of space or creating the space for other people to be heard or respected? You know, so that's something that we can all do, you know, with, we can practice it with our families, we can practice it in the mirror, we can, you know, it doesn't have to be for something big, it can really be the affirmation. Right. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, you know, I have noticed how much more confident I feel in workplace settings when one of my male colleagues will say things like that, like, well, actually, Kimmy just said that, you know, and it, it, it instantly creates a space for me to be like, yeah. I did just say that, <laughs> like, hang on a minute. Um, and, and it's one of those things that, like you said, it gets easier with time. Um, and I, I love that phrase that wellness is, you know, it's an active, it's an ongoing activity. So I think that there's a temptation, at least I see it, where, like you said, all the headlines now are right like, well-being and take space for yourself, but they feel like buzzwords without anybody actually having the conversation to, okay, so how do we actually do that? And I hate that part about it. So I, I love hearing you say that. I love hearing I love hearing both of you talking about like, yes, there are logistical things we can do. There are ways you can actually integrate this and make this happen and not just the next flashpoint. Yeah, and you know, this is Hawaii Women Lawyers. I want to acknowledge what you folks are doing in the webinars that you for your members that you know are about well-being yeah. and taking care of self. Because I mean, I, you know, I've I've been through many health challenges in my life and I'm alive you know, because of a donated kidney and a, a family who gave that gift of life. And, you know, if we don't have our health, you know, we can't do our job. We can't be there for each other. And so ultimately our responsibility is to be able to take care of ourselves so that we can support others, so that we can affect change. So you the one, I mean, you, you both, <laughs> you're the ones doing this. It's always, it's good to hear it though. We always need reminders. I mean, I think this, if anything, this last year and a half has taught us is that we need reminders to slow down and permission. So even just having this conversation, right? I mean, I know that we're all working hard, but just to, you know, reiterate to our friends and sisters and brothers that, you know, I give you permission to slow down. I, it's, it's normal for you to take care of yourself. You know, it's abnormal not to. So remember that you're a living human being that needs like Rachel described, you need your hydration, whether that's physical, you know, spiritual, psychological right. hydration. And it's, it's just, it's, it's a challenge. I think it's been a challenge the last year. So always so grateful for your words of wisdom, Rachel. I know Rachel, I, I honestly don't know if I could have made it the last few years without having met you and having grown a relationship with you. And I'm just so thankful for that time with you and thankful for everything you've done for, you know, not just the small groups of women that we meet together with, but the state, like you said, it came from a place of love. And I think it takes a lot of courage and a lot of resilience to look at something you love and say, I think we can do better than this. So, you know, thank you. And and that's, thank you for your time. And that's it for me. But Kathy, did you have, have any closing remarks then? Just 
congratulations, well deserved, Rachel, and also your your recent um, Peter Luncheon Award <laughs> from the YWCA. Right after super, yours, I did. Yeah, <laughs> super proud of you. So keep up all the amazing work, and looking forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Thank you, and thank you to both of you and your organizations, departments, what you're doing. We're all in it together. Absolutely. <laughs> we are. Thank you, guys.